I think you'll agree this is a uniquely Buffalo story about an amazing uh, collaboration between a grandfather searching for answers, Jeff Hardy, and a distinguished professor um, at the university, Fred Sachs, and who joined forces in 2009 um, to form Tonus Therapeutics. Um, Jeff is currently co-founder and CFO at Tonus. He has formal training as a nuclear engineer and has been a finance executive and investment specialist for over 30 years. He started several companies and serves on the board of directors of several local organizations. Uh, Fred Sachs is a UB and SUNY Distinguished Professor of Biophysics and Director of the Center for Single Molecule Biophysics in the School of Medicine and Biomedical Sciences. Um, Fred is an authority on cell mechanics and his research has been funded by organizations including the NSF, NIH, and the U.S. Army uh, Research Office. Fred obtained a degree in physics from the University of Rochester and has a doctorate in physiology from Upstate Medical Center in Syracuse. Please join me in welcoming Jeff Harvey and Fred Sachs. Well, thank you all for coming today. We certainly appreciate it. And we look forward to telling you our story. Uh, before I get this, uh, started, I want to just introduce two other people, a member of our team, Dr. Sahina and Dr. Godley, wherever he went. <laughs> this is how this all got started. In the middle there is my little grandson. He's five years old. and Kind of a neat story, uh, and I'm trying to bring this program here to Boston. It's called Team Impact. Team Impact in Boston. My grandson lives in Boston. Hooks up kids with fatal diseases with college football teams. And my grandson is now an official member of the Boston College football team. They gave him a locker. They gave him a uniform. He goes to the games. He did the coin toss between BC and Notre Dame. And uh, they, four or five of these guys came for Halloween, put him in a wagon, and took him door to door for Halloween, which I thought was absolutely wonderful. And uh, he was absolutely de de delighted. My grandson, unfortunately, was diagnosed with a disease called Duchenne muscular dystrophy when he was about 14 months old. As I said right now, he's about five years old. Uh, there is no cure for this disease, and the only treatments uh, to date are steroids. So he is not, he's on a, uh, a drug similar to prednisone, um, and as you, many of you may know, there are an awful lot of side effects that uh, come with the disease, unfortunately, but it's the only drug that's available and it does lengthen their lifespan and keeps their muscles a little bit stronger. The reason he got diagnosed very early, most kids don't get diagnosed, I would say, probably until they're two, but my daughter-in-law very astutely noticed he was having trouble rolling over um, and exhibiting other move movements that were not normal for his age, so... Um, he had to be taken, he had a DNA test, and, and, and of course they found out he had Duchenne. Duchenne is the most common fatal disease diagnosed in children. It only occurs in boys, and the frequency is 1 in 3,500. It can be genetic, can be inherited. In this case, my grandson inherited it. It's an X chromosome disease from his mother. The mother has no symptoms, there's nobody in, his fa in their family that has had Duchenne. Um, the average life expectancy today, I would say, was probably around 25 years old. Typically, a child, by the time they're between 8 and 10 years old, will be in a wheelchair. Uh, and eventually, the, the uh, death comes from either cardiac failure or pulmonary failure. Uh, those muscles tend to get affected later in life. Um, being a... a a curious George kind of guy, uh, I decided once I heard about this news to get on the internet and find out everything I could possibly find about this disease. And uh, I went to Providence, Rhode Island, where there was a group working at Brown University. I contacted some people at the uh, University of North Carolina. Um, I got in, involved in contacting some of the charities in this disease. Uh, I went to Boston to talk to some people. 
And on a flight back from Boston, and I thought to myself, you know, UB's a big place. There's got to be somebody working on muscular dystrophy. So I literally got home in my, in that night, and I turned my computer on, and I typed in UB muscular dystrophy. And guess what? Fred Sachs' name pops up. I'm thinking, wow. So I gave Fred a call, and I said, Fred, you know, my grandson's got to shine. I'd like to come and talk to you. So we sat down, and it turns out we were both physics majors, so we had something that we got along pretty well. And uh, we discovered, uh, I discovered that he, he had, I think, a very simple way to try to treat this disease. Um, many of the re other research in the disease is, is focused on gene therapy, and there are inherent side effects to this, and there are delivery problems to gene therapy that makes it much more complicated. Uh, what Fred will talk about, it, uh, it will, you'll see that what we're trying to do here with this drug, when we have a drug, we're not a drug development company, is a fairly simple way to try to treat these kids and get them to be able to live longer and live uh, a more productive life. As you will find out, this drug is derived, believe it or not, from the venom of a tarantula. It's hard to believe that a, a drug derived from a tarantula uh, could have a positive effect with uh, boys with this disease, but it turns out we think this is the case. So Fred and I, in 2009, we formed a company to uh, bring this drug along in the clinical process. Uh, We've got orphan drug designation, which means that there are less than 200,000 uh, people or kids and boys in this case uh, with less that, with this disease. This gives us some advantages in being able to fast track a drug through the FDA process. And uh, I, I just want to mention one more thing. Um, my wife died uh, 10 years ago of uh, a brain aneurysm, and one of the causes she was operated on, but one of the things that happens uh, in about two weeks after an operation is there, uh, the, the, uh, the blood vessels in the brain start spasming, and they call these vasospasms. And it turns out, actually, we're going to be getting a test with our drug in vasospasm, and I thought to myself, wouldn't it be wonderful if I could not only treat my grandson, but be able to save other people from uh, what happened in my life? And so now I'll be glad to turn it over to Dr. Fritzak. I'm glad to uh, scare you away. Some of you may have some scientific interest. I don't know what you mean, some people. Uh, but I won't get too techy in this. Just give you an, an, a flavor of what we're after here. And in summary, I just, just to say, that we have in hand what appears to be a drug for therapy for muscular dystrophy with a bunch of other off-label options. It's not a drug development program. We have it in our hand. We've been able to reduce the cost thousandfold since we started the experiment. Now, it's not, it's not obtained from spider, stain from a chemical company. It has a unique pharmacology, unlike any other reported pharmacology. It's a problem with reporting. You only report things I think you understand. So I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you something about cells that you will find drug companies do not understand. Drug companies operate on risk, and they have no way to assess risk for something they don't understand. So they're not in the front of anything. They stay behind and they watch. I'm going to show you something that they haven't seen.
because we had no idea that we were going to have a method to treat this. Group. We were just trying to figure out what's happening. So the focus for this drug company is, is drugs that work on mechanical stress in cells. And we're focusing on the ones that we have now, keeping our eyes open for others. But you won't find another drug company that does this. They don't exist. So what is it about mechanical sensation? You all know about years and, and uh, touch. You're probably not so aware of the feedback required to make smooth movements. You have joint receptors to tell you the angles. You have muscle receptors to tell you acceleration and force. All that stuff feeds into your brain process, right from the cerebellum to straighten out how you can do this. It doesn't explain why I can't be a ballet dancer, but that's <laughs> roughly where it is. Um, however, that's not universal. Every cell in your body is mechanically sensitive. You don't have any that aren't. If you view back in the evolution as a free living organism, it doesn't pay you bump into the wall over and over again. If you bump into the wall, you should turn around and go somewhere else. Or if somebody bites your tail trying to eat you, you should run away. How will you know if this happens? Well, it turns out even the one-celled organism You've all seen paramecium, probably, in high school biology. If they bump into a wall, they back up, and if you bite their tail, they run away. That's one cell. We evolved from one cell until we got two cells. And those two cells then got some more cells, and they all bump together to make us. And we have a history that says it pays to be mechanically sensitive. Now, there's a lot of signaling going on. Obviously, if you move, what kinds of cells are moving and pushing, let alone when your heart beats and your vessels are going like this? You know? Mechanics is all over the place, but if you say mechanics to a drug company, their eyes close. There are only three sources of energy that the cells have. They have electrical potential, these are the action potentials that run your nerves and muscles. They have chemical potential, which is all the biochemistry concentrations of chemicals producing some reaction. There's a mechanical potential, you know, if you lift weights, it's work, it's plain old work. How do you do that? That's an intimate coupling of mechanics and biochemistry. If it isn't obvious from there, you might not leave now. But mechanics and biochemistry are inexorably linked together. Turns out they're also linked to electrical activity of your cells, which is why they become sensitive to touch. So what, how do you, how do you sense mechanical inputs? I mean, look, look yourself. You can feel you're being touched. Turns out, the drug I'm gonna tell you about, this drug doesn't bother those senses. Too good to be true. We're talking about mechanical senses, but it, the drug has no effect on your hearing, your touch, or your coordination. Magic, just like magic. But anyway, these are little biological transistors. They're called ion channels, and they're, con they're not conducting electrons, they're conducting ions, charge to charge from here. So they're, they're little holes in the cell membrane, but they're under control, and the ones that we're interested in are under control by mechanical stress. At rest, they're closed, and if you stress them, they're open. We discovered these things back in the early 80s, my postdoc, Tamuni Gohari, by accident. This, my call this, this was funded by the Institute of Serendipity. <laughs> um, we found them in skeletal muscle. Now, you guys, I'm sure, do not think of your muscles as being sensory organs. I certainly do. It's the ultimate motor organ, right? Yeah, so simple. It has senses of its own. What they, they use the senses for is another story, which to this day we don't understand. But they do have senses, and we can measure them. So what is the cell membrane? Here's the cartoonist view what cell membrane is, and this 
this is a layer of what is, these are facts, phospholipids, the same thing found in a can of pan, a spray and frying pan, big things would stick. Same, same kind of fact. And the water, water soluble head, which is the round thing, the greasy tail, and, and the membrane itself has two layers like this, called a bilayer. One layer faces the cell, or in this case, faces the outside, and this layer faces the inside. Now there's water on both sides, your blood, exercise, fluid, they're all water. And the inside of the cell is 80% water. So they want to dissolve in water. The grease wants to dissolve in the grease. I mean, this is salad dressing. It's every cell in your body is a little like salad dressing. They don't mix. So with this, this thing forms a, loop, a, a, a envelope around the cell that keeps the inside and the outside separated. Sure sign of death is if your outside looks like your inside. So this thing keeps you outside. This, it's a sort of round, closed membrane, cell membrane. Keeps things from inside, from diffusing from outside, and outside from diffusing inside. That's why you're not dead. Because of those. They break down, you're dead. Okay. If this is what it was made of, this is like an inside-out soap bubble. In the soap bubble, the grease faces out and the water faces in. But it's the same materials. Same materials. So if you imagined yourself made out of soap bubbles and went out to play Monday Night Football, you wouldn't do it too well. Nature knows that and didn't leave you that way. Because in fact, the, during evolution, the ones that did do it that way aren't here today. They had no relevance. Because it didn't work. You can't go banging around with a soap bubble. It's going to break. So what do you do about it? You reinforce it. How do you reinforce it? Well, in inside of the cell, these are animal cells, they develop a, a structural skeleton of their own. This is a, a picture of some kind of cell. It could be a fiberglass. The blue spot is the nucleus of the cell, and the green is probably actin, fibers. But that's not the only part of the structure of what's known as the cytoskeleton. Cyto meaning cell, and skeleton meaning structure. It's the internal structure of the cell. It's made out of biopolymers. That's what it is. Inside the cell is a whole structure. You can see it. I mean, it's in front of you. you know, there's nothing fancy about it. Except in function, it's very fancy because everything's connected to everything and it does jobs for you. Um, the red is some other protein. I don't remember what it is, but obviously it likes to be near the edge of the cell. But there are, are thousands of proteins in there that you can't see because they haven't been stained. So this interior of the cell is very much like a gel, like a kitchen sponge. Here's a, here's a I like kind of microscope picture of what this looks like at a higher magnification. Ah, it's not really made out of fibers, right? Reinforces your cell. Now, dystrophy is a defect in fibers like this. As you know, if you had a rope and you make a cut anywhere in the rope, it can't hold the stress anymore. Great. It, it doesn't matter if you break it here, here, or here. In the case of dystrophy, that means mutation here, here, or here will remove its ability to hold force within your cell. So there are many, there are many genetic versions of dystrophy as well as, as non-genetic ones where something's screwed up in the, in the translation mechanism. But anywhere you break it, it no longer can handle stress. And this is a major molecule the cell uses to reinforce its soap bubble. It's like a, sort of like a hammock laid over the inside of the soap bubble to reinforce it, make it stronger. So what happens? How do you get sick if this is screwed up? Well, here's an interesting thing. You ever, I don't, probably never wondered about this. But every time you get a zit and you touch it, it's mechanically sensitive, right? It hurts. Why is that? There's no one in this room who knows that. 
that's how primitive the understanding is of mechanics itself. And that's why the drug company's eyes close if you say mechanics to them. It's too far out of their knowledge to form a risk base. Most of the time, these channels, these pores, that let ions flow through, in fact, characteristically, they let like calcium, sodium, potassium flow in and out. Potassium flow out of the cell, sodium flows in, calcium flows in. And calcium signals only at least 100,000 different reactions inside the cell. Elevating calcium, it's a complicated effect on cell health, notably in this group. But most of the time, they're shut. They don't do anything for a living. They're just, they're just here as, as safety valves to keep track of who's too stressed to be healthy. So they just, wherever, wherever the membrane that they're held in is stressed, they open up and it lets they send a signal to the inside of the cell to fix it up. So most of the time, they don't do anything. Consequently, you can give this drug to a, to a healthy animal and nothing happens. So this is what I mentioned, if you break, no matter where you break this fiber, it's broken, you can't hold the weight on it anymore. Okay, let me, I'm going to show you this movie. This is actually a real live movie or a real live cell to give you an intuitive sense of what, what what this means to a cell. This is a, this is a heart cell isolated from a rat. And it, you can see it will spontaneously contract on its own because the process of isolation elevates the amount of calcium in the cell. Now we put a dye in there that fluoresces when calcium sticks to it. So all those contractions are associated with that wave of calcium. Now we're just going to press on the side of the cell with a smooth glass Probe. We're just going to dent the side of the cell. <laughs> Something changed. So next time your cardiologist is sticking a catheter in your veins, poking it into your heart, that's what's happening. Okay, the, it's, it's just such a graphic example of how mechanics in, can influence a cell, regardless of whether or not you fix it. Turns out in this case we can fix it. This kind of activity is associated with atrial fibrillation. So we have a drug that can fix atrial fibrillation. Okay, what is a drug? We did what the NIH hates most, which they will never give you any money to do, which is a blind search. We had no idea what, where we could find a drug that might work. What do you do if you have a disease and you don't have a drug? Where do you go? You have to make some kind of assay. And you have to have some collection of things to try. You can order everything from Fisher and try to dump each one on in turn. Take it forever. No guarantee of success anyway. So we took a random chance, and most of this work was done by Tom Sahin in the audience, that somewhere in the insects, a, a praying insect, like the arachnids, which include spiders, scorpions, centipedes, that somewhere in their venom would be something that would paralyze the prey. So they would grab the prey, inject it, paralyze them, and they could take their gentle time and have an easygoing dinner, just sucking out the inside, and they wouldn't run away. Well, we did. We went through about 25 different animals. We went through scorpions and, and a bunch of spiders and some centipedes. And one spider turned out to have a significant response. It's not a fast assay. It's electrical assay on the electrical activity of the cell. And it came from a tarantula, which is lucky because tarantulas have our big, our, our pet in the lab is rosy. She's about this big. They have more venom than little spiders. So for us, it made life easier. So out of all of it, you take the venom, and when I began this, I thought venom was, that's concentrated poison, that's what it is. It's not true. Venom is a collection of hundreds of compounds. 
It's more like our saliva than it is like what's a, a, a concentrated poison. It's just hundreds of compounds, and what we could do is dilute the venom, dump it on the cell, and see if it works. Okay, it works. So now you narrowed it down to the 250 compounds. That's all. To do then is a whole bunch of chromatography until you luckily end up with one item that produces the effect you're looking for out of those 200. We did that. It turned out, it didn't have to be, but it turned out to be a small protein, approximately the size of insulin. Small protein. There's a picture of it here that we made with an NMR structure from synthesized material. We, we don't get it from spiders anymore. It's, it's chemically made in a precise way. It's much cheaper that way. But what I showed you in the heart is that if you distort the heart, it gets hyperexcitable. You could see those calcium waves spread it. We know that at least half of all cardiac arrhythmias are caused by mechanical defects. Blood pressure, aneurysms, Anything, anything that changes stress in cells makes your heart arrhythmic. I was working with a cardiologist from Georgetown, like Mike Franz, and he had been working on the effect of mechanical stress on arrhythmias for a long time. So we got together, did experiments on rabbit hearts, intact rabbit hearts, because we had been doing rabbit, but we took the heart out as a whole heart. And if you stretch the atrium by raising the pressure, it'll fibrillate. And the more, you, this, this curve here shows, the more you raise the pressure in the atrium, which stretches it more and more, the more it fibrillates. And it's reversible. You lower the pressure, they stop fibrillating. For those of you who have AF, I mean, there's two and a half million Americans that have it, so somebody here may have it. Um, so this is what happens. If you, if you stretch it, you get more fibrillation. So what do we do? We <laughs> take our, our pet, pet, peptide and we put it in the heart. It's only, it's only 170 nanomole. Put it in, and this is what happens. It takes a whole lot more pressure now to make your heart fibrillate. This is, uh, so this is therapy for muscular dystrophy. Is the stuff toxic? At this point, we didn't know, but I can tell you now it's not toxic. So those of you who have AF, here's a therapy, but by same mechanics, too, too, too big pharma, their eyes drift closed. I said kinase, they wake up. They like biochemistry, but they don't like mechanics. They don't know that they're connected. I don't know how they figure they could lift their arm without mechanics and biochemistry and mixing, but it doesn't seem to like that. Okay, so here it is. So we here's this, here's the Rosie from whom whose species produced the venom that contained our active compound, and this is active compound looking at it from different angles after we did the three D structure. Only thirty four amino acids, very tightly linked together as three disulfide groups, so it's almost spherical. And you can't raise antibodies to this. It doesn't have enough loose ends to raise an antibody to. It. So you won't get an antigenic reaction in an animal if you give it. It's very stable. We soaked it in trypsin for two days at 37 degrees and nothing happened. Particles are so tight together that trypsin can't get a handle on it to start chewing it up. The other thing that we did, I mean, we made it synthetically. Phil Gottlieb here did all this chemistry. Uh, it's made synthetically. Now we have quotes for it in the kilogram range. You know, if you, if you start thinking about population, those can, can be made in the kilogram range. But uh, as I said, when we started with the spider venom, it was about $1,000 a milligram. Now it's a dollar and a half a milligram. So we make products. Is it cheap as an aspirin? No, it's not. But on the other hand, if you're going to die from what you have, it's cheap. One of the things that's really surprising about this, we had a bet in the lab about it, is, you know, if you try to put your right glove on your left hand, it doesn't fit so well, right? But traditional pharmacology says you make a drug, and these drugs are handed. 
like glove. And the drug, like your right hand, slides into your right glove and does whatever groovy thing it's supposed to do. This drugs are supposed to do. However, if you actually fed it your left hand and it slipped into the hole, it wouldn't slip in. It consequently wouldn't get any effect. So we had a bet. How is this drug working? <laughs> so Phil made the mirror image of it. So the natural form is what's called an L and amino amino acid. The other one, the mirror image, is made out of D amino acids. It's chemically identical. And it looks exactly like the natural form would if you looked at it in the mirror. We fed, put that on itself. It's worked identically to the L one. So there is no narrow, stereospecific selective site. It's acting in a different way. We think it's dissolving in the membrane. It's a little bit like a, like a detergent. And squeezing the channel so it doesn't like to open. So it's not like any of the traditional drugs that you could buy or get prescribed, which, if you flip them over, wouldn't work. Okay, now, if we're talking dystrophy, this is, a, this is the movie that Tom made. That's a muscle cell, a dystrophic muscle cell living in a dish in the lab. And that's calcium tracer again. So spontaneously, these dystrophic muscles are having a letting calcium in. But when, the minute we add the, add the drug to it, look what happens. That's it. So the idea that we have is take that same drug and put it in the boy, and you get the same effect. If you put normal muscles in there, they look like they look quiet. You don't see any flashing. Normal muscles don't do it. Dystrophic muscles do it. And it's known from labs in our lab and around the world that one of the characteristics of dystrophic muscles is too much calcium. But we have the way the block the entry of calcium in a reversible manner. If you took this drug, you could also wash it out if you took too much. But it's, the drug is so non-toxic, that's why I don't want to call it a venom anymore. I don't I want you to call it a peptide. It's not a venom. Venom is a mix anyway. And it's not poisonous. It's the opposite. It's so non-toxic you should view it's therapeutic. And we think the spider uses it as a therapy to keep its prey Prey's heart beating as long as it can to circulate the rest of the metal. Anyway, so here's a, that's that's the kind of in vitro data that says here's a therapy for this. So what have we done with it? Well, we have a bunch of unpublished data. Once you enter the biotech business, you end up talking to lawyers all the time. So I can't. It's so against my tradition of saying everything that I know about. And Kevin published this. <laughs> but I'll, I'll leak the information to you um, overall, which is, it's almost impossible to kill an animal. We looked at the maximum tolerable dose in rats and mice. We succeeded in killing one rat. These are IV doses with the maximum amount you could possibly inject as large as the animal use committee will let you inject. So that's how hard you have to work to have a problem. The other ones that didn't die and had the maximum dose, they're a little bit logy for about an hour. There were no cardiac effects. We injected it into ferrets, free-roaming ferrets that, that had telemetered EKGs and temperature and stuff like that. You know how it is, it's the Vioxx, the Vioxx VX go. Now you have to test everything against potassium channel-related defects and cardiac arrhythmias. FDA requires that for every drug now, regardless of whether it makes any sense or not. Well, we did it. We injected into them, in, into the ferrets. These were about 12 ferrets. And they ran around, and we reported their EKGs and their temperature and so on and so on. Nothing happened. No change in the ST interval, QT, every, all that stuff was nothing happened. Fundamentally, nothing happened. So that's okay. We looked at how long does it stick around in the animal because if you shoot it in and it washes right out, it's not, not too good a drug. 
It actually turns out that there's two, com two main components to it. One washes out in about six to ten hours through, directly through the, uh, most, seems to be most of the by the urine. But the other one, if you get a shot, is you can find it a week later. How's that for a half life? So in principle, if you were taking this drug, you wouldn't have to take it very often. We don't know. We haven't gone to times longer than a week yet. But if it's there in a week, it's probably there for two weeks or three weeks also. So you want, you, in practice, we were doing this with um, subcutaneous administration. You don't have to take it IV. At the moment, we tried to, to do it orally, put it right into the animal's stomach, but it didn't want to absorb it that way. But it also doesn't mean that it's not possible to do it. An oral absorption of one kind, which I haven't had the time or money to check it out. And there's no toxicity. We had about 100 mice running at the Wellstone Center for Muscular Dystrophy for about a month, injected every day. Nothing happened. We did behavioral tests and all kinds of things, and histology, and roughly nothing happened. Okay. No toxicity. I, the definition of toxicity is absolutely undefined. FDA has its own rule. You know, you put it in the dish, you get some fix of DNA, you get this, that, and the other thing. But in fact, the thing that really matters is it going to affect the animal's behavior, and the answer is no. It probably won't affect our behavior either. Contrary for, for, for uh, on his foot, we got some poison ivy, supposedly help that. But that's all we know about human pets. No, I did it. I did a, I had a test also. I burned two fingers on it. And Phil made control and a test and mixed them up. And that's always a blind test. And I put one tube on one, one burn and the other tube on the other burn. Didn't make a difference. <laughs> but it was a human try. Nothing bad happened to me. Uh, What's going on now is the, the one key thing that we really want to show is whole animal efficacy. Now we've tried this with dystrophic mice in Wellstone centers that are, were initially funded by the Army. Now ask, you can think about why the Army wants to know about muscular dystrophy and how many, how many soldiers have muscular dystrophy, but they funded it anyway. This is a good, good grant getter to do this. Okay. Anyway, the centers to test drugs for muscular dystrophy were funded by the Army. We did test there, and it wasn't clear. The answer is it wasn't clear, and what we found was that a lot of stuff in the literature is also untrue. It made, us, made it very wary of the test, so one of the things we did was to develop a new test. We were collaborating with the University of Maryland on this, where the... What, in, in a sense, you think that while well, the kids' muscles are degenerating in dystrophy, if they don't exercise more, they can build them up. The opposite is true. The more they exercise, the worse it gets. And the parents with kids with dystrophy tend to be advised to get a ranch house so you don't have stairs. Going down the stairs is the worst thing you can ask a kid with dystrophy to do. Because they land, they have to break the acceleration of the landing with the tension in the muscle. And that kind of stretch is the worst thing they have. Um, so we, we're running a test in collaboration with a, with a friend at, and also a district expert at the University of Maryland where we have, we have the mice in wheels. You know, a regular hamster cage. But we have it computerized. We can keep track of how much they run. And it's it's been looked at before that mice with dystrophy don't run nearly as much as mice without dystrophy. So we can now have a big measure of efficacy to the drug. So this is an ongoing test, and I can't tell you the answer because I don't know it. But that, that one piece of data is the last piece of serious data that we need for this to enter the clinic. So during this experiment, we'll just keep track of, kind of different kinds of mice. We have three different we have normal mice and two different mutants called MDX, which is a dystrophic mouse mutant, 
that really doesn't differ much from a normal mouse behavior. And CMOT, which is a recent knockout of an extracellular protein that also has weak muscles. We do both of those. So as far as our company, what's the advantage? Well, number one, our lab at UB is the world center for the study of mechanical sensor function. That's where you would go. We've also developed lots of other tools. We can measure the stress in real time in living cells and living animals in specific protein. So we can ask, where is the stress that we need to fix? We have a patent on these peptides that's owned by UB and it's now licensed to Thomas. And there are no therapies for much of this dystrophy, so it's not as though you have to show you're better than something else, because there's nothing else to be better than. And it's been designated an orphan drug by the Food and Drug Administration, as Jeff mentioned. This, one of the things it does is it's possible to go from the laboratory to patients in one step. You don't have to give it to normal people. If it's an orphan drug, you can go from the lab to the patient. And it's very hard to know. When it, I was at a drug meeting recently, and people were saying, damn mice. mice. Mice are different than people, oddly enough. Even <laughs> uh, But a lot of the things that the mouse metabolizes and the way they metabolize is different than the way that we do. So even though it worked in the mouse, a lot of drugs have failed when they hit humans. No, it's not the final test, and you shouldn't depend on the mice for the test, but there is no other accepted test for muscular dystrophy in animals. That's the best we can do. So we're going to have to go to patients next. And there's another, uh, the FDA guarantees you another seven years of sole propriety after the patent runs out if necessary. So why are we focusing on muscular dystrophy? If all your cells have these channels, why focus on dystrophy? Well, obviously Jeff made the case as to why. The JV, we're going to try to get this figured out before, before JV gets too weak. Jeff's grandson. It's an, as an orphan drug, it makes it easier to get this through the FDA. Um, we do have the orphan drug status. But, as I said, if every cell in your body has this, you should keep your eyes open for other diseases where it's also screwed up for one reason or another. Anything to do with cell mechanics will produce changes in this system. So in the case of dystrophy, you took out the support. That made the membrane fragile. These channels turned on and they leak calcium into the cell, making the cell sick. It was actually activates proteases that digest the kid's muscle from the inside out. Really sucks. If we could slow it down, there are repair mechanisms that muscles have. If we could slow down the degradation, the natural methods that the body has to build up the muscle might be able to compete. So they can be Maybe held in a plateau, even if they're not cured. We've showed already, show you the map, they can block atrial fibrillation. There's a lot more people with atrial fibrillation than there are with dystrophy. That's a big market. There, there is no therapy for muscular for atrial fibrillation. You think somebody would care? I can tell you that Medtronic absolutely does not want to see any drug that has to do with rhythm. We talked to, talk to them already. They don't want this. They make too much money for pacemakers. So you've got to watch who you talk to about this. We've shown, we published paper showing that the same thing can be applied to the same drug. It can be used for sickle cell anemia. Sickle cell anemia is an, get another orphan drug common to black people. It's, it off, it off, it's common to them because it also offers malaria resistance. But what happens is if at low oxygen, the, the hemoglobin in the red cell crystallizes and makes crystals. 
pushing out on the membrane. That's a force. That force causes the channels to open. We can inhibit that. Here's another orphan drug application. But again, it's off label. We've gotten there. Turns out, di in diabetes, one of the most common effects is kidney failure. You know what that costs? The U.S. You know, Medicare alone, thirty billion a year for dialysis. Thirty billion. There's evidence that this drug can allow many people to come off dialysis. You think if we if we if we found that, you think we wouldn't catch flack from uh, from the dialysis manufacturer? I don't think we'd be so free. We have a grant from the Army to use it, to see if we can use it as an addictive analgesic. Because you know whenever you get a zit and you touch it, it hurts. It's more sensitive. Why is it more sensitive? It's, it's mechanically coupled with something. Something happened with infection. You make it mechanically sensitive. Can you inhibit that? Can you inhibit the pain on a piece of shrapnel in your knee? I don't know. We're trying that now. Can't say we, we have anything that's going to replace morphine, but it's possible. And so on and so on. Again, every cell in your body has the same targets. The drug doesn't bother them unless they're sick. Too good to be true, the drug only hunts out sick cells. Cells are under, under extreme mechanical stress. You couldn't invent such a thing if you wanted to. No side effects. Selective for six cells, regardless of origin. Is that too good to be true or what? So why isn't everybody doing it? Number one, they don't know this. Only we know this. And I told you the drug companies fall asleep. If you say mechanics to a drug company person, that's what happens. You want to put them to sleep. It's a hypnotic drug company for <laughs> um, We now know the target of where this drug is acting. Phil cloned it, cloned the human form out of a common cell type used in many laboratories called HEK cells from the scientists. Everybody uses them to express their pet genes, but in fact, every single one of them has these channels. Does it affect your experiment? The answer is, I guarantee you they don't know. Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't, but we have it. We know, we know the primary structure. We have the DNA structure. There's a disease, a blood disease, a hereditary blood disease called xerocytosis. It's kind of anemia. The red blood cells shrink and get fragile and break. You get anemia. Turns out it's because of that target channel. And, and Phil introduced those mutations into the channel, and by God, the activity of the channel changed. It didn't close. Normally, it just opens and closes. After it has a mutation, it opens and slowly drifts on its way toward closure. Meanwhile, all the ions are running downhill and, and, and making the cell kind of sick. This drug will cut down on that flux if you wanted to try it. We have another orphan drug. It's about one in a thousand, one in two thousand people have this disease. I don't know if anybody here has it. Anybody here have it? Zero symptoms? Or know anybody? Sure. Okay. Anyway, that's another spin-off. But this is a case that we really know about because we've done the test. And we know the drug's non-toxic. Somebody wanted to pick it up. Use it. Thank you. It just floats around and it's it's kind of sticky to membranes. So where it finds the membrane, which is everywhere, it sticks. No, it, it, well, it, it will work IV, but it, it's simpler to go subcutaneous so and let the blood carry it around. The peak concentration isn't so high when you do subcutaneous, so if there is a toxic effect, it's much lower when you go subcutaneous than I do. Does it only work for things that have to do with cytoskeletal 
abnormalities? No. In this case, for example, in the, in the xerocytosis, blood cell anemia is because of a defect in the channel itself. The channel itself has one of two possible mutations, either one of which keeps the channel open too long. For those of you who've looked at how red cells go through capillaries, the capillary is smaller than red cells. You've got to stuff them through there. They have to really deform to get through the blood cell. And if you take a cell of a fixed volume of material and you squeeze it, you know, you a, water, a water-filled balloon and you just squeeze it, what do you think is going to happen? And you're going to leave. Your hemoglobin would fall out of the red cell. So nature, in its own clever way, found a way to adjust the cell volume during the transplant of the capillaries. And if you screw around with that, you get anemia. And you won't find that in any textbook of, of hematology or circulation, which they didn't know that this channel was involved. But they will in a couple of days when publication comes out in the National Academy of Science. Yes? I wonder if you can talk a little bit about your plans for commercialization. Right, commercialization. It's, in, in drug company terms, some executive has the money we need in his pocket. Mm-hmm. It is unbelievably, it's unbelievable how inexpensive this is. For us to get this into, through the FDA, I, I got a quote the other day from the biggest drug testing company in the country. About a little over a million dollars. Talk about drug development. What does a million dollars mean to a drug company? The janitors pick it up every day from the aisles of the company. It is so small, it is so small that one person who's well off and has a kid with this would be would have a good bargain if they just gave us enough money to get it through the FDA. We are almost done with the tests. All the formal tests that the FDA requires would cost just a little over a million bucks. We have one other ongoing test on efficacy at the University of Maryland that's, that's a couple hundred thousand dollars. And then we're in the clinic. In case of an orphan drug, the FDA has only 30 days to say no. If they don't say no in 30 days, you are allowed to be in the clinic. And you are allowed, because it's an orphan drug, to go to patients, directly to patients. You don't have to go through healthy people on the way. You mentioned that you administer it subcutaneously and oral dosing does not work. Have you considered uh, a topical? Uh, Topical skin? Yes. Well, we talked about buccal applications and all the gums. Uh, we just haven't had the time or money to check it out. The other one is, the other way to do this is, I have a fantasy of uh, like an asthma spray. Just put it in there, sniff it in, and you get your entire surface area of your lungs to absorb it. It is an amphiphilic compound, so it's likely to go right through your lungs into your circulation. So it, it, there's, a good chance, there's a good chance it could be administered just by sniffing. The muscles are all around the body, and uh, yeah, it's you have to go through the skin, but then, uh, anyway, anyway, it's possible. All I can tell you from Tom's experience is nothing happened to me when I was skin, nothing happened to me when I put my skin. It doesn't mean nothing happened, but when I dilute that amount of material into my body, the concentration was so negligible that if something was going to happen, it could happen. One more. Yes. Have children in tropical areas that have been bitten by tarantulas shown any changes to their symptoms? <laughs> well, the answer is that it isn't published. I can tell you, first of all, it isn't likely. Just remember that, that the venom itself, first of all, these tarantulas almost never bite. That's not their defense mechanism. Uh, so there's almost no reports. Somebody, they're one of the most common tarantulas you can get in a pet store. Um, that it felt a little bit like a bee bite. Not, not, not much to happen. But the venom has hundreds of compounds, and there are things in there that will do unpleasant things to you. It's not like Black Widow, it's not a bad thing. But, you know, who wants, who wants a bee bite? Uh, and are you going to get better, or are the other things going to make you worse? The only thing is there is a homeopathic 
volume from about 1900 that refers to a tarantula venom in Cuba that is used to give the people heart conditions. I'm not backing that up because that is what was out in our literature. Thank you.